Our second scripture reading today is 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 17 through 34. Now in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For to begin with, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and to some extent I believe it. Indeed, there have to be factions among you, for only so will it become clear who among you are genuine. When you come together, it is not really to eat the Lord's Supper. For when the time comes to eat, each of you proceeds to eat your own supper, and one goes hungry and another becomes drunk. What? Do you not have households to eat and drink in? Or do you show contempt for the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What should I say to you? Should I commend you? In this matter, I do not commend you. For I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and said, This is my body, that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this, as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be answerable for the body and blood of the Lord. Examine yourselves, and only then eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For all who eat and drink without discerning the body eat and drink judgment against themselves. For this reason, many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined, so that we may not be condemned along with the world. So then, my brothers and sisters, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. If you are hungry, eat at home, so that when you come together, it will not be for your condemnation. About the other things... I will give instruction when I come. This is the word of the Lord. Setting the scene, this is the church in Corinth, one of the early churches developed after the death and resurrection of Jesus. Apostles and disciples are running everywhere across the whole world as they know it, spreading the good news of Jesus Christ. And so as instructed, the Corinthians gather together. They sit down, they have a meal together. Okay, we've done the Lord's Supper, right? Paul says, no. And more than that, when you're trying to do that, you're making the church worse rather than better. Oof. So what's going on here, and how are the Corinthians practicing the Lord's Supper? First of all, they would not have had buildings for churches like we have here in our beautiful sanctuary, in Oxford Hall, even our live stream capabilities they would have been meeting in private houses. And so, because they were in a context in which they were already familiar, some of their contextual traditions of the world crept in. They were going according to dinner party rules, or perhaps even airline rules, where the privileged people who paid a lot get the seats in the center with better food and better service, and everybody else just gets to file in around them. Hope you brought your own snacks and economy. They're doing what their culture tells them to do. So what's going wrong? People are coming together for the worse instead of the better. And so Paul identifies some of these problems as, first of all, everyone is welcome in this room, at this table, at this place. And that's not happening. We also identify that some people are eating to excess, drinking and getting drunk, while some people have nothing. We identified that there are divisions among the people, not just small ones, but ones that are getting in the way of their ability to practice this. And so ultimately, it's a problem that this has not been set aside from the context of their everyday lives. So let's break this down. Eating too much versus some who have nothing, that's probably the easiest to understand. Can you imagine sitting down at a dinner and having some people with three plates of food and others with nothing? Weird move. 
the church crossed some socioeconomic lines, and so people were unused to bringing people from different social status into their house as equals. And so it had to be explicitly named for them. Your responsibility is to provide food for everyone, or it shames not the people who don't have enough, but the church as a whole for failing. The funny thing is, Paul tells people, if they're hungry, to eat at home first. Because it's not about you. If you need to eat at home first so that you can be fully present in this community, do that. Everyone has a place in this room and at this table. And not just a place, but food to eat and to share. Countercultural already. But surprise, just getting everyone in the room isn't enough. There are divisions that are threatening their unity. And they're not just the socioeconomic divisions we just talked about. they are also divisions created through their beliefs. In a world in which the death and resurrection of Jesus is so new, people are hearing about this for the very first time. And so, you know how when you hear something new from someone and you're not quite sure what is the core truth and what is their slant on it? That's what's happening here. And so people are getting into arguments and competitions with each other about which apostle or disciple they heard the word from and what's most true and who got the best message. And so, divisions are one thing. But divisions that get in the way of celebrating the Lord's Supper... That's a totally different thing. We don't get to come together and center ourselves or our quarrels or our disagreements and let them interfere with one of the most sacred acts that Jesus gave to us to practice. We don't get to do that. Or at least we shouldn't. So that's our big picture problem. The church at Corinth, their understanding of the Lord's Supper is being subsumed by the cultural context in which they live instead of the countercultural way that Jesus brought. And that's what Paul is calling out. You're hurting people's understanding of the church when you replicate societal patterns instead of what Jesus is teaching. At its heart, as Paul describes it here, the Lord's Supper is remembrance of Jesus' saving death and good news of the covenant. This is world-shattering news then and now. We might have gotten a little used to it. It was brand new for them. And so, in light of the good news of the covenant, that means responsibility to God and to one another, how could they possibly keep doing business as usual around the table? They missed the point. How could they persist in their own ways in light of this new way of being? Because when we come together at the Lord's Supper, we should be coming together as the unified body of Christ. Not as a bunch of individuals competing with each other or arguing about which apostle brought the best interpretations of tradition or trying to figure out the most holy color of the carpet. No, the Lord's Supper is a corporate act. It is something that we do as a community that God has brought together for a purpose. No matter what is going on outside the doors of the house in Roman culture, when they gather as the church, they are to eat communally. They are to see to each other's needs in addition to their own. They are to make sure that everyone has a place at the table and that everyone is fed because it is bigger than any one person. It is about our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. When we come to the table, we can come with different opinions, different personalities, different ways of living. That's all fine as long as joining together as the body of Christ is what is at the center. And we have a responsibility. The end parts of our text about judgment can seem rather harsh, but they drive the point home that no matter how you enter the Lord's Supper, with joy, with somberness, or anything in between, what you shouldn't do is enter into it lightly. No matter who we are, we have not earned a place at this table, nor is it our table. 
we are invited to it by Jesus Christ. He's the one who invited Judas, who later betrayed him. He is the one who invited the disciples who fell asleep on him multiple times. If he can do it, we should too. We have a responsibility as the church today to make sure that everyone hears the good news of Christ. We have a responsibility as the church today to make sure that when we gather for the Lord's Supper, everyone has a place at the table. No matter their gender or their race or their sexuality or their wealth or their favorite college football team or anything else, everyone has a place here. And leaving the door open isn't enough. We need to make sure that all are invited. One of the most powerful communion memories I've ever had was during a Monday Thursday service in which we actually ate a full meal together and also participated in communion and foot washing. And that particular day, I was on the piano in the back corner playing music, and I was in a bad mood, and I decided I was not going to partake, and I was just going to stay in my comfortable corner. And you know what happened? Someone came over to the piano and invited me in. And I don't know about you, but that is the kind of church that I want to be in. Or more specifically, that's the kind of church that I want to be and that's the kind of church that we get the chance to be if we only have the courage to do it. The communal body of Christ gathered in the new covenant should look different than our outside society. Otherwise, we're not any better than the Corinthians, confusing the Lord's Supper for a social status dinner party. To be fair, we don't have it much culturally easier than they did either, our culture continues to reward wealth, status, and privilege, and to stratify society accordingly. It can be easy to lose sight of what matters, and yet, that's what we have to do. We have to remember that Jesus Christ is calling us to the table together, shoulder to shoulder, with the expectation of eating and drinking together in a way that does not serve each of us individually, but communally as the body of Christ. In short, we're called to unity in Jesus, which means making sure everyone will be welcome at and fed at this table. Here at Myers Park, all who approach the table will be served because that's what Jesus did. Why? Because Jesus lived with us. Because Jesus died for us. Because Jesus' resurrection is good news for everyone. Because as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the saving death and resurrection of our Savior Jesus Christ until he comes again. Amen.